If you have a Bible, please open it to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And please turn in your bulletin to page 7. I want to give you a little bit more detailed orientation to our series. We started last week and we'll go to July 1st. And I want you to know that the title of it, based on this text, is From Eternity to Eternity, How God Claims and Keeps You. And look right underneath that. What I've given you, I've teased out for you the different sermons we're going to look at based on key words that Paul gives us in this text. This text, as I said last week, just pops with theological richness. It overflows, as it were, with the beautiful, rich themes of the things God does for you through Jesus in the gospel. So, for example, see on the far left there, we're going to look at this word election this morning and actually next week. And then we run into the word calling, and then we run into salvation, and justification, sanctification, glorification. We're going to unpack these rich themes because God intends to use these in your life to give you a profound assurance and confidence that you are His, and He will never let you go. How God claims you, how God keeps you. So I'll read this verse. We're going to be reading these uh, five or six verses every Sunday between now and July 1st. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you from the beginning to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. If you've ever played pickup sports on the playground, you know how it works. Two people are designated as captains And then they alternately choose teams from everybody that's there. And who do the captains choose first among the group? The best players. If I get chose last, that means I am deemed the worst player in the group. Why do people choose the best players? They want to win. We got winners. We're going to stay on the court and keep on playing. What happens when God chooses teams? He chooses losers. When God looks upon humanity and calls a people to himself, God loves the unlovely. He chooses the unlikely. He saves the wretched. He calls his enemies. The Bible calls this choice election. For Paul, it is a cause in this little paragraph of endless thanksgiving. Look again the way he begins. He he planted this church and he's probably writing this letter some number of months later. And he writes to them as if he had visited Calvary years ago and is writing to you. Hear this for you. We should always give thanks to God for you, brothers. Beloved by the Lord, because he chose you from the beginning. Paul looks at you, Calvary, and he sees that you are the beloved of God. He's filled with gratitude. 
<laughs> he sees the work of God in you, trophies of his grace. These magnificent people who are the work of the grace of God, and he calls them beloved. In other words, the elect of God are also exactly the beloved of God. It fills him with thanksgiving. And in that, in that the point of verse 16, he loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. He's just oozing all of this theological richness. So I want to take two sermons to examine this doctrine. It has found itself, unfortunately, to be controversial among Bible believers. And this week, we'll look at what it's not, next week, what it is, and how to obey this doctrine. First of all, what it's not, and why do I need to begin kind of as a negative? Here's why. Sadly, there has been a characterization of God vis-a-vis -vis this teaching, the teaching of election, that's just wrong. And you may have been taught this. You may have been taught that election means God is standing at the gates of heaven, stiff-arming people who want to be there. This mean ogre, people going, let me in, let me in. This God going, no, no, you're not elect. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Nothing. If that's what you were taught, push delete in your hard drive. The Thessalonians and you and me are to receive this doctrine for comfort. They're under the gun, beloved. There's persecution, there's pain, there's suffering, as I said last week, for identifying with the name of Jesus. And when life gets really hard, you begin to wonder what? Am I going to make it to the end? Is this really worth it? And some of you have no interest in being on God's team. If you say, Mike, if I were honest with you, maybe not publicly, but if we had coffee and if I were very honest with you, I would say, I have really no interest in being on God's team. I don't care whether God picks me or not. This doctrine gives you tremendous hope because it explains why we all naturally have no interest in being on God's team. And it gives us hope that God can change our desires, but more on that in a second. The Thessalonians receive this for comfort, assurance. God's with you. God's going to see you to the end. So first of all, here's what this doctrine is not. It is not a teaching designed to keep anyone from God. You should assume, suppose you're a person, you have no interest in God, no appetite for God, you don't be on God's team. You should assume God wants you on his team. People that you're seeking to love for Jesus in your neighborhoods and beyond, you should assume God wants them on his team. Think about Jesus' invitation in Matthew 11. Come unto me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Now, are, are you wearied by your sin? Are you burdened with guilt? Are you striving under angst that, will I get to heaven? Could God really accept me? Jesus says to you, come. Come to me. Jesus is calling the world, all of us, to come to him. Echoes of this in John 7. If anyone is thirsty, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Is your soul parched? with trying to please God? Are you dying? Are you, are, you, are you dying to be right with God? Jesus says, come and drink. Come freely. Come to me. The God who is saving sinners on this earth would have every one of us come. Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if you're still not convinced, Romans 10, 13 a bold, simple, irrevocable promise, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're a whoever and you'd like to be saved, call on his name with the absolute assurance God will save you. This doctrine is not designed to keep you from God. 
if you rewind into Acts 17, where Paul first preached at Thessalonica, he did not preach the doctrine of election. He's giving the doctrine of election to people who are already saved. What did he preach when he went to Thessalonica? He preached Jesus. Acts 17, 2 and 3, Paul went into the synagogue as was his custom on three Sabbath days or three consecutive weeks, presumably, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to die and rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. The Christ of your Old Testament Scriptures is exactly the person in history, 20 years later, who died and rose for you. He preached Jesus. You will never hear in this church sinners called to Jesus using the doctrine of election. You'll hear them called to Jesus using the doctrine of Jesus. <laughs> now here's what's interesting. In the book of Acts, as the first Jewish Christians were watching the Spirit of God convert Gentiles, and to them it was like, wow, that's different, that's surprising, we didn't see that coming. When they saw the Spirit of God converting Gentiles, they reflected on it from a heavenly perspective what exactly God was doing on the earth. For example, look at the handout, Acts 11, 18. Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. So the reflecting human beings were responding to the gospel. Why? According to this verse, God was giving them the gift of repentance. Or Acts 13, 48, all who were appointed to eternal life believed. Why were people believing, beloved? They were appointed to eternal life. But that's not preaching the gospel. That's reflecting on what is happening from God's perspective after the fact. Second thing the doctrine of election is not, and I've sort of alluded to this, but it's not answering the question, how do I become a Christian? It's answering the question, why did you become a Christian? Why am I a Christian? How did I get into this in the first place? You'll, you might often hear, oh, you people who believe in election, there's a lot of nicknames for that, Calvinists and this and that and this and that. Don't worry about the nicknames. You often hear this objection. Well, if what you say is true, why do evangelism? Okay, that's a, that's a fair question. So let's take three key words, election, the gospel, and evangelism, and let's see how they connect with each other by saying what exactly is the question being answered with each of those doctrines. For example, the doctrine of election is answering the question, why did I become a Christian? What's the answer? I became a Christian because God made me one. So the doctrine of election, sometimes it goes by the phrase sovereign grace. Sometimes it goes by the phrase the predestination of God's chosen ones. Lots of different phrases for it. Don't worry about that. All those words are in the Bible. So you've got to wrestle with what does the Bible mean by those words. And essentially, the doctrine of election presupposes what the Bible says is true, and that is all of us are born into this world dead in sin, which means we naturally have as much appetite for God as a dead person has appetite for food. Ever met a corpse that was asking for food? No. There's no human being in their natural condition asking for God, seeking God, desiring God. In fact, not only do we have no innate desire for God, we have a subconscious aversion to God. It's worse than being neutral. <laughs> An election is that God looks on that kind of person and says, I actually want you and I'm going to save you and I'm going to bring you to myself and I'm going to give you the gift of faith. The doctrine of election is answering the question, why did I become a Christian? God did this. He gave me the desire. What's the doctrine of the gospel? The gospel, doctrine of the gospel is answering the question, how do you become a Christian? And the gospel is, God gives his son for sinners. You can find everything you need to be right with God in Jesus Christ. Trust his promise to save you from your sins. The gospel is believing a promise of God. I will forever treat you as if you've done everything my son has done when you believe and trust in him. The gospel answers the question, how do I become a Christian? 
Answer, believe the promise of the gospel. The third word, evangelism, is answering what question? Who can become a Christian? Evangelism is doing what? It's announcing to other people what God has done in Jesus for sinners. It's living in such a way that they are seeing the life of Jesus manifested in you, and as God gives you opportunity, you are articulating exactly what God has graciously done for anyone in the world through His Son. That's evangelism. It's not answering the question, uh, how do I become a Christian? It's not answering the question, why did I become a Christian? It's answering the question, who can become a Christian? And Jesus said, I'm saving the nations. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in the sight. Okay. Does that make sense? Third thing, the doctrine of election is not. It's not a teaching that makes God unfair. You may have exposure to Christian teaching denominations that don't like the doctrine of election because they say it's unfair. God chooses some and not others. Is it a fact that God chooses some and not others? Is that a fact? Yes, it is a fact. He chooses some and not others. Incidentally, if you want to be chosen, ask him and he'll save you. I mean that with all my heart. See, right now, I'm pre right at this moment, I'm preaching to you what doctrine? The doctrine of the gospel. There's nothing in this doctrine that keeps you from, wanting to, from being saved if you want to be saved. If you want to be saved, Romans 10, 13, call on the name of the Lord and he will save you. Apparently, God wants you to know once you're in right relationship with him, as you look back, God wants you to know, I did this. <laughs> I gave you the gift of faith. I gave you the repentance that leads to life. I chose you. Is God unfair to choose some and not others? Does he owe everybody a chance? Well, in some sense, absolutely. And if you work through the opening chapters of the book of Romans, you see that God gives everyone a chance through the witness of creation and the testimony of their own conscience. And what human beings will find is that sin and unbelief resides in their heart and it isn't there because God put it there. It's there naturally. It's not God's fault I was an unbeliever. It's not God to blame that I'm a rebel against God. God isn't the author of sin and unbelief in my heart. Human beings are. Now, it's another discussion for another day how it actually got there in the first place, but set that question aside for a moment. And if you're troubled by how it got there in the first place, all you need to do right now is call on the name of the Lord and he will save you. And if you refuse to, you have no one to blame but yourself. He will save you. Jesus is here to save you today. This doctrine is keeping no one from the kingdom. I will probably repeat that five more times before I'm finished this morning. Is God unfair? Paul... Reasons in Romans 9 have given you a portion of the text there that basically God owes no one mercy. In fact, mercy isn't a matter of what you're owed. It's getting what you don't deserve. <laughs> and because God owes no one mercy and all he truly owes anyone is condemnation, the fact that God shows mercy to some does not create, create an injustice to others. Here's an illustration. This Christmas you go to Willow Grove Mall and you're shopping and it's all crowded with all different kinds of people. And you notice there's a lot of people maybe you would deem poor, walking around the mall, and they're just window shopping. Nobody really has any money to buy anything. And your heart is moved with compassion, and you go up to somebody, and you go, See, what's your name? Oh, your name's Hannah. Here's $20. Just get yourself something for Christmas. That was an act of what on my part? Mercy. She didn't deserve that. I don't even know Hannah. I just chose because my heart at the moment was overflowing with love and compassion. I just chose to give someone something they didn't deserve. Had I created injustice against Penny by not giving her something? No, I didn't owe Penny anything. There's no injustice created by me showing mercy to one person and actually not giving. I didn't owe anybody at the mall anything, right? I just chose freely to have mercy on one person. There's no injustice at all with God. If God were just, he'd give us all hell. But through Jesus, 
He offers immeasurable mercy, forgiveness, grace, and life in his Son. Here's how Paul reasons it out. He anticipates this objection. Verse 14, Romans 9. What should we say then? Is there injustice on God's part for choosing Isaac and not Esau? Is there injustice for God choosing one person and not another? By no means. For he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. Push pause. Would you like God to have compassion and mercy on you? Would you? You ask him now and he will. Absolutely he will. This doctrine is keeping no one from being saved who wants to be saved. Call on the name of the Lord and he will save you. There's number one. So then it depends not on human will or exertion but on God who has mercy. What's the it? The it is the salvation of a soul. It depends on not human will but on God who has mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, for this purpose I raised you up that I might show my power in you that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whom he wills. He hardens whomever he wills. In the case of Pharaoh, Pharaoh's sinful, repeated refuser to do the right thing creates a judicial hardening on his soul. Pharaoh, at any moment, Pharaoh could have been saved, as far as we're concerned. At any moment in the Exodus, he could have said, I'm doing the wrong thing, save me, Yahweh, and God would have saved him. God is not responsible for the sin in Pharaoh's heart. God is choosing to show mercy on some. No injustice. I hope that's clear. If it's not, we can talk some more. Fourth thing, this doctrine is not. It is not something we call passive foreknowledge. You may have been brought up in a church or taught by Christians that said, oh, well, the Bible it talks about election. The Bible talks about God choosing. The Bible talks about predestination. But here's what that means. God knows ahead of time that you, of your own free will, will take initiative and choose God. And based on God knowing that ahead of time, having that foreknowledge because God knows that, he elects you based on that. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's not what the Bible teaches. Very little glory to God as Savior in that view. In that view, God is a spectator. He's just watching you make your own choice for God. The reality is God is an active participant in election. Look at the verse from, I provided view from Romans 8. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become formed to the image of his Son. And whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. It's very similar to the text we have. All these neat words we're going to tease out and find the rich meaning for comfort, for assurance, for joy, for confidence. This is a very parallel passage to the one in 2 Thessalonians. God is acting here, beloved. His foreknowledge isn't just knowing facts. He knew you. He knew me. When I have doubts with my faith, and I think, is this really true? Did that ever happen to you? It happens to pastors. Could I really be a Christian? Do you know what doctrine I come back to? I come back to the fact that this world was created by somebody magnificent and the doctrine of election. I'd never be a Christian if God hadn't done it. Never. I, I find tremendous comfort in my soul in this doctrine. That's why it's given to Christians. Is it given to keep any of you from the Lord who want to be with the Lord? Is it given to keep anyone away? No. If you desire to be a Christian this morning, should you call on the name of the Lord certain he will save you? Yes. So what's, <laughs> what's the problem with the view that foreknowledge means God simply looks down the carters of time? As one famous evangelist said, his hands are tied. He forces himself on no one. God is waiting for you to make the decision. It's up to you. You've got to make the initiative and choose God. The problem is the Bible says when God looks down the quarters of time, you know what he sees? A cemetery. A bunch of dead people. <laughs> There's nobody in there going to choose for God. We're dead. The amazing thing about this doctrine is God looks down the quarters of time. He sees dead rebels and he says, life for you, salvation for you. I will create in your heart a desire for me and I will call you to myself. Now that's going to be a sermon in a couple weeks. So God's knowledge, God elects you not because of your faith. He elects you to your faith. More we could probably say about that. Let me give you the last point and then we'll be finished. 
what this doctrine is not. It's not a mystery that the doctrine is taught in the Bible. It's a mystery, why me? Sometimes people say, this is a controversial doctrine, let's just stay away from it. There are churches that choose to do that. Whole churches that say, eh, you know, Christians don't agree on this, and they don't. Let's just stay away from election and predestination and choice. Let's just focus on other stuff. Sort of mysterious. And as a, as a pastor, John and I and John O and I and Sam Logan and those of us trained in theology, we would say it isn't a mystery that the Bible teaches this. It's very clear that the Bible teaches this. People are controversial. Doctrines aren't. And if the Bible teaches it, you've got to believe it. And it's good for you. It's really good for you. What's a mystery is what God would do for sinners. I keep singing all week a song that we sung at my church in Virginia, The Mystery of the Cross. Um, I cannot comprehend the agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, crossed your son. He drank the bitter cup reserved for me. Let's go back to a moment in history before the creation of the world. And God needed to choose teams. And myriads of myriads of worshiping angels, as far as the eye can see, are surrounding the throne of God. And there is a hush coming over their ceaseless adoration. And the Father says, I need someone to accomplish the victory for me. No angel moves his lips. And the Son says, Dad, I'll go. The Father elected his son to go to earth and nothing like the NFL draft. It's in Philadelphia the last four days. Every player being drafted is drafted on the basis of their ability, not their inability. Every player being drafted has dreams and aspirations of hope of winning a Super Bowl. Jesus Christ was elected by his Father not to come and win some game, but to succeed where the first Adam failed and with the certainty of excruciating pain and agony at his cross. The mystery of the love of God. How can God do this? Send his perfect, precious son to love his enemies and on the cross experience hideous, hideous, Agony, torment, pain, rejection, scorn. His father turns his face away. That's a mystery that God would do that. That's what it took, beloved, to make you his own. Do you think now you and I can be more gentle, humble, worshipful, caring for other people who don't know this gift. This is the last thing I'm going to say. I'm thinking Calvary at this very day in her history. What does this doctrine mean? God knew the Thessalonians needed to know about election. Life was tough. Life was difficult. They were being persecuted. But I suspect reading the entire epistle I want to just read for you. I suspect there's something else going on. At the end of chapter 1, verse 11, to this end we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You get the sense that Paul has a concern that Calvary, Thessalonians, just kind of tempted to sit down. Tired. 
Some of you have been at this a long time. Somebody else can step up and do the ministry. Ah, I think the doctrine of election gives you a kind of joyful confidence, no matter how old and tired you are, to say we're in a season right now, Calvary, transition, where I, 80 years old, tired, served, let the other people come. I, my prayers are needed now more than ever. My tithes are needed now more than ever. My greeting and loving and welcoming the saints are needed now more than ever. Beloved, this doctrine gives you a beautiful impetus to be all in on God's team at this particular season. Does it? That's, a, that's an application I believe is in this text. So you ask the Lord. No matter how old you are, you can pray. Lord, every time you're in here, fill this place with worshipers. Bring us the lost. Bring us the destitute. Bring us people that you will change like you changed me. He'll answer that prayer. And we're going to see it happen, aren't we, in our day. Let's pray.